This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. It's February, and you know what that means. It's the month of love. Valentine's Day is just around the corner, and it's considered the most romantic day of the year for those who celebrate it with a special someone. But what is love? Love is a concept that has kept poets, songwriters, and romance novelists in business for ages. Everyone has a different idea of what true love looks like, feels like, and how you know when you are truly in love. Some believe in love at first sight, and others believe that for love to last, it must start as a friendship and then build over time. Still, others are jaded by love and try to avoid it at all costs. This may be due to their past experiences, perhaps having suffered through an unrequited love, or having had their heart broken when a relationship ended. If you are in this camp, then the words of the band Def Leppard may resonate with you. Love bites. The couple you'll meet in this month's series took that sentiment literally. As self-described vampires, Daniel and Manuela Ruda immerse themselves in not only goth culture, death metal music, and satanic rituals, but they actually made it their goal to become vampires, of the actual biting, blood-sucking variety. However, this would not be enough for them, and together, they decided that in order to become real vampires, they must find a human victim to sacrifice to Satan. This is one of the strangest love stories I've ever encountered. I've titled it Love Monsters, the story of Daniel and Manuela Ruda. The bride wore a black rubber bustier adorned with metal rivets and buckles. Her hair was jet black, with one shock of hair dyed pink on the top of her head. She wore an upside-down cross around her neck and carried a small bouquet of white roses and baby's breath. The groom wore a leather jacket over a black t-shirt adorned with the name of a black metal band. His head was shaved except for a small patch on top. In the couple's wedding photo, they stare coldly into the camera as if daring the photographer to snap their wedding day portrait. The couple, Daniel and Manuela Ruda, had chosen a specific date on which to take their vows. No, it wasn't Valentine's Day, the first day of spring, or any other recognized day that conveys the hopes and dreams of new love. Instead, they had chosen their wedding date for the number, June 6th, 6 6 Their favorite number was 666, and while holding their wedding on June 6, 2001, was just one number off from being perfect for their special day. Six 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 is a number that has long been associated with evil incarnate, the Antichrist, the devil, and all other names associated with Satan. Before Daniel and Manuela had even met one another, they had both pledged their loyalty to the devil. The date they had chosen to wed was just the first promise they fulfilled as a way to show their devotion to their dark lord. Daniel had met his bride through a Lonely Hearts advertisement in a heavy metal music magazine titled Metal Hammer. The personal ad he carefully crafted to find his perfect mate read, Black-haired vampire seeks princess of darkness who despises everything and everyone and has bidden farewell to life. Somewhat poetic, if heavy on the creep factor. Manuela was also a fan of black metal bands and of the magazine. She was intrigued by Daniel's ad and responded. Before long, the two were not only inseparable, but began sharing an apartment together in Bochum, a city located in North Rhine-Westphalia. In addition to both being fans of metal music with lyrics laced with graphically violent descriptions, hate-filled tirades, and misogyny and racism, Daniel and Manuela had other common interests. Number one was being fans of Satan, as I already mentioned. And a close second was the common goal to transform into real-life vampires, a.k.a. monsters of the immortal, sleeping in caskets, the blood-sucking variety. 
It seems that two such individuals might find it a considerable challenge to meet someone with such specific goals and interests, let alone fall in love and marry one another. But love be crazy, am I right? And you never know when and where it will strike. So if you're single and feeling like you'll never find your person, well, if these two specimens can do it, then there's hope for all of us. But I digress. Anywho, let's rewind so I can tell you a little bit more about these two vampire wannabes. Daniel Ruda's early life is a bit sketchy, but I'll do my best. Privacy laws are stricter in Germany than in the U.S., and the press tends to be a bit more respectful of these guidelines than we're used to. Daniel was born in 1974 or 1975, and as a teen, he allegedly was diagnosed with an unspecified mental illness. According to later court psychiatric records, at an early age, quote, Daniel felt detached from his fellow humans, and even as a child, he often flinched at physical contact, end quote. There is no information on whether he suffered from any type of abuse or other trauma as a child. What we do know about Daniel is that by the time he was in his late teens, he already considered himself different and superior to his peers and community members. As a way to distinguish himself from others, Daniel immersed himself in counterculture and rebellious activities, and attired and decorated himself in such a way as to shock and offend those he considered his inferiors. He claimed that when he was in high school, he was visited by a dark being who called himself Samuel. He said he was compelled to obey this apparition's orders to devote his life to serving Satan. Daniel began dressing in all-black clothing and wearing t-shirts with graphic images of violence and obscene and hateful slogans. He shaved his head except for a small swath of hair just on top, like a baby mohawk. He was partial to wearing black leather clothing with chains, jackets, pants, and fingerless gloves. He was also drawn to all things that he felt resonated with his disgust and hatred of humanity. He embraced the neo-Nazi movement and the ideology of Germany's extreme right-wing political leaders. At the age of 20, Daniel began volunteering for the National Democratic Party of Germany, a far-right neo-Nazi and ultranationalist political party founded in 1964 as a successor to the German Reich Party. The German government has tried unsuccessfully to outlaw the party as a threat to constitutional order. Germany's neo-Nazis learned that a large group of disenfranchised young people were ready and willing to help them spread their platform to other young people and exploited this free labor. They used young men like Daniel Ruda to bring in recruits to the organization by supplying them with free tickets to concerts that featured Nazi metal bands. In return, these recruits who pledged their loyalty to the party felt emboldened to wear military-style boots and clothing decorated with swastikas and adopt other Nazi symbols. However, the NDP did poorly in the 1998 election, after which time Daniel lost interest in politics. Instead, he fell in deeper with goth and black metal culture. Now, I'm sure when I say the word goth, it conjures up pictures in your mind of pale-skinned, raven-haired young people, dressed in all black, with scads of tattoos, piercings, coal-rimmed eyes, black nail polish, etc. You get the picture. And you would not be wrong. That is the look that is associated with those who identify as goth. But where did this term come from? How did it become associated with metal music? And for Pete's sake, how did some of these people decide to embrace vampirism and other dark fetishes as a result? I'll get into all that in a moment, but let me get through Daniel's bio and then tell you a little bit about his dark princess, Manuela. Daniel became immersed in the German Gothic community where he met others who shared his dark proclivities. He began calling himself Sundown. Already well acquainted with black metal bands, in 1999, Daniel became a member of a band called Blood Sucking Freaks. The name is, I would say, self-explanatory. I have no idea whether Daniel played an instrument or was just a background screamer. I'd say singer, but, well, listen to a few of these bands and you'll know what I mean. All I know is that he is described as a member. At this time, Daniel got way into the whole vampire shtick. He actually began to identify as a vampire, which I didn't even know was even a thing. As part of this transformation, he filed his canine teeth into points to resemble fangs and took part in rituals in which other vampire and vampire adjacent people cut themselves and took turns sucking each other's blood. Daniel claimed to have discovered his, quote, craving for the metallic taste of blood at the age of 12. 
But still, Daniel was actually human. And as a red-blooded human being, sorry, I couldn't help myself. He craved human interaction and perhaps even love, just like anyone else. I'd imagine that he'd started pursuing the personal columns in his reading material of choice just out of curiosity, but soon realized it might be a way to find just the gal he was looking for. So in the year 2000, he placed the ad I described in the opening of this episode on the back pages of one of his favorite metal magazines. And just like that, Manuela appeared. What do you think of when you hear the term self-care? If, like me, it conjures up more chores to add to your to-do list, eating more vegetables, getting to the gym more often, going to sleep earlier, etc., it probably doesn't sound very relaxing or like very much fun. But self-care should be about saying yes to the things that make you feel good, things that are just for you, and don't make you feel guilty about not doing them. Dipsy Stories is something you can add to your life that you'll look forward to. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories that will transport your mind to a world where you can relax and treat yourself to your deepest desires. Dipsy stories bring scenarios to life, scenarios with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. You can choose stories about second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, or hot and heavy hookups. The stories are radically inclusive, too, with same-sex couples as well as stories voice acted by people of color. And you can even choose stories for your astrological sign or voiced in British accents. Whatever takes you away for 10 or 15 minutes or more to your fantasy world. New content is released every week on the Dipsy app, and you can listen to standalone stories or follow your favorite characters over a series of stories. For listeners of Once Upon a Crime, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com once. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories dot com slash once. Dipsy stories dot com slash once. Manuela Bartel was born in Wheaton, Germany in 1979. She grew up as an only child in a middle class family. By all accounts, Manuela had a normal conventional childhood. She was shy and not very popular, but a good student. But at the age of 13, Manuela began to show signs of emotional problems. She became very moody, stopped interacting with her family and peers, and started dressing all in black. At first, her parents didn't worry very much about these changes. They simply chalked them up to typical teenage angst. Unknown to them at that time, however, Manuela had already begun experiencing auditory hallucinations. She heard a disembodied voice telling her to do strange things, and she felt compelled to obey. She eventually decided that the person directing her was none other than Satan himself. Her mental health deteriorated quickly until one day she began biting strangers she encountered on the street until they bled. Her parents had her admitted to a psychiatric hospital to be evaluated. Her diagnosis at this time is unknown, but she began seeing a psychiatrist regularly. However, her mental state began worsening and she dropped out of school before she was 16 years old. She continued to believe she was being directed by the devil. At first, this distressed her greatly. She overdosed on drugs, and it's unclear whether this was a suicide attempt or an accident. In either case, Manuela's mental and emotional health was clearly in a steep decline at an early age. Unstable and out of control, she left home for good at the age of 16. She ran away and landed in North London, where she quickly fell in with a group of young Goths. Manuela, having felt like an outcast and a freak due to her mental issues all her life, felt more comfortable with other people who lived outside of normal society. And goth culture, it must be said, does not discriminate. The weirder, the better, I guess you could say. There are as many ideas about what constitutes goth as there are goths. But I'll take a stab at describing it for you if you're not familiar with the term or the culture that it identifies. I won't go all the way back and give you a history lesson on the Visigoths. For that, I'd have to start with the third century, and we don't have time for that. So I'll fast forward to what is more commonly known as Gothic in the modern era. Gothic today most commonly refers to something that is characterized by mystery, horror, and the macabre, especially in literature. 
Some of the most well-known classics of Gothic literature are Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and, of course, Dracula by Bram Stoker. But in modern times, Gothic themes and symbolism have become synonymous with certain types of music as well. In England and in the U.S. in the 1970s, bands began embracing darker subjects in their lyrics and reflected this in their manner of dress and the way they staged their live shows. Groups like Alice Cooper, Black Sabbath, and The Damned included elements of horror and violence like murder, death, war, and even vampires and monsters into their music. Punk music sometimes crossed over into gothic themes and took on a harder edge or metal sound, although they're not the same thing. And we would need to do a whole discussion on the evolution of rock music genres to do this subject justice. And again, we don't have time for that in this episode, but it's a fascinating topic if you want to look into it. A band from Manchester, England changed its name to Joy Division in 1978, and their sound became an inspiration for later gothic bands. After founding member Ian Curtis hung himself in 1980, the group eventually reinvented itself as New Order. Later, a more industrial goth sound resulted in groups like Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson. So, where does all the vampire stuff fit into this? We have to go back to the late 1970s and early 1980s, when groups like the Misfits and Bauhaus dominated the genre. Gothic music was at its peak of popularity, and new groups like the Sisters of Mercy inspired bands to embrace even darker subject matter, including vampirism. The band Dark Theater had a leader who called himself Vlad, wore removable fangs, and claimed to drink blood. As these types of groups found an audience, bands started to make more outrageous claims, pull more outrageous stunts on stage, and delve into darker subject matter in their lyrics to make a name for themselves. Edgier music and more music genres emerged as a result. Metal music was broken down into subcategories, like dark metal, doom metal, and death metal. Black metal is often described as an amalgamation of gothic music and heavy metal. One of the pioneers of black metal is the British band Venom, whose lyrics include many references to both Satan and vampires. In 1981, they released a song titled Sons of Satan, in which they state, Live like an angel, die like a devil. Got a place in hell reserved for me. Gonna burn in hell, that's where I'm gonna be. In another song titled In League with Satan, this time they add vampirism into the mix. I'm in league with Satan. I was raised in hell. I walk the streets of Salem. Amongst the living dead, I need no one to tell me. What's right or wrong? I drink the blood of children. Stalk my prey at night. Other subjects typical of black metal include anti-Christianity sentiments as well as vandalism of graves. Daniel and Manuela Ruda would partake of this activity together. They claim to have an interest in collecting skulls, which may have been true, as some would later be found in their apartment. You can see how some teens and youth who felt abnormal, or like they didn't fit in, might resonate with these themes and lyrics. Those especially who have suffered from feelings of depression, or think that no one acknowledges their existence in any real way, might be drawn to the idea of living amongst the shadows, like werewolves or vampires. The lore surrounding vampires states that they shun the daylight and only emerge at night. This would probably be an ideal lifestyle for those who feel as if they are virtually invisible to conventional society. Adopting the identity as a monster would provide them a reason to remain unseen, because they're special, not of this world, but set apart from others in their uniqueness, and not simply because they are weird. This was the acceptance Manuela had been craving, and it seems she found this among the children of the night, or the youth that made up the goth subculture in and around London. She took a job at a goth nightclub called The Slime Light in Islington. The club catered to goth youth, some of who identified as vampires. From these new friends, Manuela soon learned how to, quote, become a vampire. She attended bite parties, where attendees drank each other's blood. However, unlike vampire lore, jugular veins were off limits, too dangerous. Instead, the person offering the blood would cut themselves, usually on their forearms, and then offer it to the other person to drink, usually just by licking it. Okay, this is kind of grossing me out, but I'm sure you have the picture by now so I can move on. Manuela, who at this time was still kind of a plain chubby teen, became desired by the men who attended these bite parties or were patrons of the club where she worked. She said that these men began chasing after her. Some of the patrons were also involved in satanic rituals. 
Manuela became excited to learn that all the things she had experienced as a child were now part of her new identity. She had been compelled to bite people as a young teen and also believed she'd heard the voice of Satan directing her actions from an early age. Now she thought it all made sense, if she was, in fact, a vampire whose mission it was to serve Satan. In 1998, Manuela, now 19 years old, returned briefly to her hometown. A friend whom she reconnected with at that time remembered Manuela as appearing more confident, but always wanting to be the center of attention. Manuela now loved to be photographed, and it is alleged that she had been a model for sadomasochistic publications. Manuela next traveled to Scotland, where she was hired as a housekeeper at a hotel in the town of Skye. Manuela had heard stories about a man who lived on the Isle of Skye, and she became obsessed with meeting and befriending him. The man's name was Tom Leopard, and he was known as a local recluse nicknamed the Leopard Man of the Isle of Skye. Tom Leopard, whose real name has been reported as Woolridge or Woodridge, spent 30 years in the Navy, joining at the age of 15. He served as a color sergeant in the Rhodesian Special Forces. At one time, he was stationed in the Zambezi Valley, the biggest open wildlife conservation preserve in the world. After leaving the military, Leopard found it difficult to transition back to civilian life. He didn't care to hold a regular job and couldn't imagine himself living a normal life among civilians. He made it his goal to become, quote, the biggest at something, and something that people might pay him for. Kind of a vague goal, but it all worked out for Mr. Leopard. He struck upon the idea of tattooing his entire body from head to toe. He chose one specific type of tattoo to cover his body with, leopard spots. This was not because he had a particular affinity for the animal. In fact, leopards were one of the few animals he didn't encounter in the Zambezi Valley. No, he had chosen leopard spots because he thought it was easier than having multiple types of tattoos created. It took over 18 months for a tattoo artist to ink the yellow and black spots over 99% of his body. Even his eyelids were tattooed with blue-green cat-like irises. It cost Leopard 5,500 pounds. He would later make the Guinness Book of World Records as the most tattooed man in the world. He then moved to the Scottish Isle of Skye, where he made his home in a thatched hut. Living away from society, Leopard survived without electricity, heating, or gas. He wore no clothes except a small loincloth to, quote, preserve his modesty, and made infrequent trips by kayak to the mainland for supplies. He lived a hermit's existence and soon became a curiosity for Scottish locals and later people from around the globe who had heard about the leopard man. Many sought him out and he entertained visitors fairly regularly, people who were simply curious to see the spotted hermit. Manuela was one of the curious. When she arrived at his hut one summer, Leopard treated her as he would any other visitor. He was friendly, but didn't become close to anyone. Leopard later recalled Manuela as a teen not unlike others who'd sought him out. He said it was his understanding that she had traveled to the Isle of Skye on holiday. She did stay on the island for a time, he said. At this time, she would have been about 18 years old, and Leopard close to 60. After she left the island, they corresponded for a time by letter. He even received a thank you note from Manuela's parents, thanking him for being so kind to her and befriending her. But later, the letters he began receiving from Manuela turned, quote, hate-filled and crude. As a result, he stopped responding. Later, when Manuela Ruda's connection to the Leopard Man was reported in the press, he became upset by the rumors that he'd had a sexual relationship with the teen. Leopard said nothing of the sort had occurred. He stated that he was a devout Catholic who spent at least three hours a day in prayer and would not entertain such a relationship due to his religious beliefs. Manuela returned to Eton once again and immersed herself in the goth scene. She was deep into the Satanist and vampire subcultures by this time and on October 31st, 2000, performed a ritual in which she dedicated her soul to Satan and vowed to serve him. It was not long after this that she stumbled upon Daniel's ad and met her, quote, match made in hell. Daniel and Manuela moved into an apartment together in Bochum. They both now identified as full vampires. They even cosmetically altered their appearances as part of this new lifestyle. Daniel had his teeth filed into fangs, and Manuela had two of her teeth replaced with canine teeth, also to resemble a vampire. Mr. and Mrs. Ruda were a sight to behold in town. They drove around in Daniel's car with the words, 
Corpse Processing Plant Bunker Gate 7, 85221 Dachau, inscribed upon it. Dachau, the name of a Bavarian town, became synonymous with a Nazi concentration camp that was located there. Also painted on the car's windows was a pentagram, a satanic symbol, and upon the trunk, the words Grave Beauty were written. Daniel still held a day job selling auto parts, but Manuela immersed herself completely in her vampire role, shunning the daylight and only emerging from the apartment at night. The couple purchased a coffin that they slept inside of. I'd imagine only one at a time could fit into it. They traveled to cities like England and Scotland to take part in group activities with others that shared their lifestyle. They attended rituals, partied with other Satanists, and slept in graveyards. I assume this was some type of vampire camping trip. But their all-encompassing goal, one they shared together, was to become real vampires. They prayed to Satan to ask what they must do to realize this dream. They decided that the first thing their Dark Lord required was that they marry on his day, 6-6 or June 6th. That done, the second requirement that they believed Satan demanded they fulfill was a blood sacrifice. Their rationale was that they had married on 6-6, but as we know, symbolically, the devil is associated with three sixes, not two. The third six, they believed, would be completed by offering a human sacrifice to Satan on July 6th, one month after they wed. But who would be the victim? They chose 33-year-old Frank Hackert, a co-worker of Daniel's. Hackert, or Hacky as they called him, was a warm, friendly, and funny guy who easily befriended others. Although Daniel and Manuela could be described as odd, and even strange, by outsiders, Hacky became friends with them and accepted them as they were, without judgment. Perhaps his friendly nature led to his doom. He may have been an easy mark for the Rudas, easily lured into a trap because of his trusting nature. They would later say that they chose Hackard as their blood sacrifice because he was funny and would be, quote, the perfect court jester for Satan. So on July 6, 2001, Daniel invited Hackert to their apartment, saying that they were throwing a party and would like it if he would attend. Hackert agreed. But when he arrived, he was the only guest. He found this a bit odd, but Daniel put him at ease, saying the others were just late. Small talk was exchanged, and Frank Hackert was completely oblivious to the murderous intentions his hosts had planned. Until it was too late. The root of shocking crime would be called a picture of cruelty and depravity, such as had never been seen by prosecutors. I'll share all the details of the crime, the manhunt for the Rudas, and the aftermath in part two next week. That will do it for the first part of Love Monsters. Come back next week for part two, which will release on Monday, February 20th. Make sure to follow or subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. If you're a Patreon member, you won't have to wait a whole week for part two. You get every episode of Once Upon a Crime before anyone else and can listen ad-free. To find out more and join, go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. Do you want to keep up with what's new and upcoming on Once Upon a Crime? You can remain in the loop by following us on our social media channels. It's a great way to connect with me and the OUAC team. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Once Upon a Crime Pod. You can also join our Facebook group to interact with me and your fellow listeners. Look for Once Upon a Crime podcast fan page on Facebook. Follow and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search for Once Upon a Crime podcast on YouTube. We'd love it if you'd follow us on Twitter at Upon a Crime. And if you're on TikTok, find us at OUAC Pod. Get all the links to our social media channels at our website, truecrimepodcast.com. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Additional research and the outline for this episode was created by Emma Bataglia. Thanks so much for listening and telling a friend about the podcast. You rock. Until next time, I wish you all love, and not the creepy kind. And be good to one another. <laughs> <laughs>